Welcome back to week four of our course, Boltzmann Law, Physics to Computing. This is the fourth lecture for this week. <clears throat> now, in the last lecture, we established this basic framework for the quantum description. That is <clears throat> how a quantum spin is represented by these operators, these polyspin matrices, two by two matrices. And in terms of that, you can write the energy operator or the Hamiltonian matrix from which you get the probability matrix or the density matrix. And then you can calculate the expected value of any observable if you know the corresponding operator. Now, in this lecture, what we'll do is consider a two qubit system described by an energy operator of this form. We have these two spins and they have an interaction and work out some of the consequences. Hopefully this will give you a be better feeling of how these things work. <clears throat> okay. Now, if you write out all the terms, you'd get this sigma 1x, sigma 1y, sigma 1z, etc. And you'll get h in terms of all of them. And we have discussed how to write these matrices for these two spin systems. And you can evaluate all of these. Now, what we'll do in this lecture, we'll assume that these individual one spin type of terms are all zero, just to keep the algebra simple. And consider just the interaction term. Now, the interaction term, though, has three parts, right? It was sigma 1 dot sigma 2. So there's a xx, a yy, and a zz. So now, how do you write sigma 1x? Well, that's sigma x, that's the polyspin matrix, Kronecker product with the identity matrix. And that's what gives you this expression, right? For the, this is a four by four matrix representing the spin, representing the x spin on number one. Similarly, if you want x spin on number two, you take the identity matrix for one and take the Kronecker product with sigma x for 2. Right? This is the kind of thing that we have been going through in the last few lectures. And if you take those and multiply it out, you get the operator for sigma 1x, sigma 2x. And as we discussed, these operators commute. So I could have multiplied in the reverse order and still we'd get the same matrix. Now, if you want the y component, then you have to first write sigma 1 y, which is sigma y chronicled with i, and sigma 2 i, which is i chronicled with sigma y. And again, these are, again, using the principles we discussed, you can write them out straightforwardly, and then you'll multiply it out and you'll get this matrix. And you'll notice it looks kind of like this one. It is in the sense that all the non-zero terms are on this cross diagonal. I mean, not the regular diagonal, but the one on this side. And, but here two of them are minus one, but here all of them are positive. And then you can do the sigma 1z, sigma 2z. Again, exactly the same principle. And this one has all the non-zero terms on the regular diagonal. It's plus one, minus one, minus one, and plus one. Okay. Okay. So now, if we want to write out the total matrix, which means you have to add them up, then you see you've got these three things to add up. And the items on the diagonal come from sigma 1z, sigma 2z, because the other two have all zeros on the diagonal. So if you look at the diagonal, that just comes from the z term. And on the other diagonal, meaning the one that's running like this, that's where when you add these two, you get this one and one add up with one and one to give you two. Whereas this one cancels the minus one, and this one cancels that minus one, so you get a zero, two, two, zero. Okay. So that's the final matrix that you obtain. Now, <clears throat> these off diagonal terms are coming from the x and y terms of the original Hamiltonian matrix. Okay. Now what we need to do is find the density matrix, which is exponential of minus h. 
And of course, if we ignore the off diagonal terms, which came from x and y, then this would be all equivalent to doing just classical spins, because then you'd have a purely diagonal matrix. See, that means if you ignore these, then you're just keeping the z terms. And then if you do exponential of this, you see the way you exponentiate a matrix is that along the diagonal, the way you exponentiate a diagonal matrix is along the diagonal, you just put down e to the power negative of that quantity. So you have e to the power minus j, e to the power plus j, the plus j, and e to the power minus j, and the rest are all zeros. Okay. So in this limit, when you have ignored the sigma x and the sigma y terms, we have ignored all that, we just get what we'd have got in the classical case, which we looked at, I guess, in weeks, week two probably. And what it shows is that 0, 1, and 1, 0, the height would be e to the power plus j, which means if j is a positive quantity, these would be the tall peaks. The 0, 0, and 1, 1 would be e to the power minus j. And of course, if j were negative, then the roles would, have, would be reversed. Right? And of course, these are probabilities. So finally, you have to normalize it so they all add up to 1. So this is exactly what you'd have got from classical spins. That's what you'd get from the quantum theory if you ignore the off-diagonal terms, which amounts to ignoring the x and y terms. Now, if you keep the x and y terms, then you'll get something that looks a little different. In a sense, qualitatively, it's still similar, that for positive j, 0, 1, and 1, 0 are accentuated. That's the physics of it, that positive j means that whenever the two have the same spin, that tends to have the higher energy, and so they tend to get suppressed. But in the quantum case, firstly, you'll notice that in this case, the 0, 1, 1, 0 seem taller with respect to 0, 0, 1, 1 than what you had here. And the other case, when j is negative, that's where it's very interesting. Doesn't matter how big you make j, you could make it minus 10. The thing is, 0, 1, and 1, 0 would never get suppressed beyond this factor of 2. It is always half of this. So whereas in the classical case, if j were negative, then 0, 1, and 1, 0 would gradually get suppressed exponentially as I increase j. Now, why is this difference? Well, you can kind of work this out analytically. It would look like this. Well, you see, if you ignore the off-diagonal terms, exponential of minus h would have looked like just exponential of minus j plus j plus j and minus j along the diagonal, if you ignore off-diagonal terms. Now, when you include the di off-diagonal terms, the point to note is that as far as the two extreme ones are concerned, which correspond to the 0, 0, and 1, 1, they are still di basically diagonal. That is, whole matrix is kind of block diagonal with the first and the fourth one being one block, and the second and third one being another block. So when I'm trying to write the exponential, the first one I could still write as e to the power minus j, and same with the last one. But it's the middle one that requires careful evaluation because we have this full matrix. That is where you have to do the matrix exponentiation the proper way. And if you do that, you'll get a matrix looking like this, where you have two a same number on the diagonal and the same number again on the off diagonal, but they're a little different. One is e to the power minus j plus e to the power plus 3j. The other is e to the power minus j minus e to the power plus 3j. So based on this, you can understand what, you, what I had shown you before. And these are all things you can easily check with MATLAB or Python. Now, if, for example, if j is positive, then you see uh, what happens is that this first and fourth components get suppressed strongly, e to the power minus j. j is a positive thing, so those are small numbers, and indeed they're suppressed. Whereas when you look at the middle here, again, as far as probabilities, we are just plotting a, and if j is positive, this is small, so basically it is e to the power plus 3j. So that's what happens here. It is e to the power 3j. And of course, overall, this 
these have to be normalized so that they add up to 1. Now, if j is negative, that's the interesting one, then e to the power negative j is a big number. e to the power negative j is again a big number. And here, because j is negative, it's the e to the power plus 3j that drops out. And so you're left with half of e to the power minus j. So what that means is, doesn't matter how big j is, finally the ratio will be always 2 is to 1, or 1 is to half, because they're all involved e to the power minus j, but just that there is an extra factor of half for these middle ones. So that's kind of how the whole thing will work. And as I said, these are things you can easily calculate numerically and check how, it, how you do this. Okay. So that then kind of shows how you could you know, calculate the density matrix for the system of two interacting spins. And you could have kept the direct one spin terms as well in this discussion. Once you know how to write the matrices, the processes, all straightforward. And once again, once you know the operators corresponding to what you want to observe, you can calculate the, you can predict the measured values, what you expect to observe when you measure them. Now, when people talk about chemical structure of molecules, they usually have Hamiltonian matrices describing these molecules with, that look kind of like this. So for example, for a hydrogen molecule, one of the simpler models would lead to a Hamiltonian matrix looking something like this, with lots of different spins. So there are four spins, which are sigma 0, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. So it's a four spin system but with various matrices looking like this. So each one of the matrices appearing here would be like 2 to the power 4 by 2 to the power 4 type of things. And you could uh, write them all out, these 16 by 16 matrices, and, find, and work, out the, uh, work out the Hamiltonian and diagonal and find the density matrix and calculate the properties you're interested in. For, so on the other hand, you could build a 4-bit quantum computer to solve this problem, right? And that, as I've mentioned before, that is one of the basic rationales for why you might want to build a quantum computer. Of course, in this case, the direct calculation isn't too hard because it's 16 by 16. But as you know, this grows up exponentially. And when you have bigger molecules and you want to calculate the structure, the direct calculation would involve huge matrices. But if you built a relatively small quantum computer, it in principle could solve the problem for you. Except that the challenge is how to engineer all these interactions. That is, how do you make sure that the interaction between, say, the Z spin of the second, Z component of the second spin and the Z component of the third spin is indeed G11, etc. That is the part that is hard to engineer, that is the challenge that people face when actually trying to build the quantum computer. So in summary then, what we have done in these last four lectures of this week is establish the general framework on how you can write the energy matrix for our n-spin system and calculate quantities of interest. What we'll do in the last lecture of this week is we'll talk about an possible application that involves relatively simple interactions. As I said, in implementing a quantum computer, with the biggest challenge is implementing the interactions that are needed, whereas this particular application requires relatively simple things. So that's what we'll end the, this week with. Thank you.